Well, I think it looks like it's about time to get started. We want to make sure that we reward all of you who have been here and arrived on time. Thank you for that by starting the program on time. My name is Jessica and I work here at the Great River Road Visitor and Learning Center at Freedom Park. We have a fantastic program lined up for you. I want to first give a brief thank you to the folks who make this possible. Uh, we have the Friends of Freedom Park nonprofit organization that operates this visitor and learning center at Freedom Park. And we operate it on behalf of the city of Prescott who actually owns the park and the facility. But our nonprofit uh, fundraising with the generosity of our community, our members and donors, and some wonderful foundations make these programs possible. These environmental and cultural education programs are available to you generally at no charge. Um, we do have some great programs coming up as well, so please check out our website. Thank you to the Prescott Foundation, the Gertrude Shealy Charitable Trust, and the Nelson Family Foundation, as, long, as well as, excuse me, our long list of um, members and donors to make the <coughs> fundraising possible to have programs like Mr. Ossie to come see us. I'll bring him up now. Do you want to come on up? Sure. So he was the director of the Red Wing Environmental Learning Center for 30 years is what we have. Yep. yep. <laughs> Did it feel like 30 years? Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. He's also been a volunteer interpretive naturalist at Frontenac State Park for a good long time, 14 years I believe. Yep. Yeah, and he has his own nature blog, Wakuda Nature Notes. So probably really well acquainted with phenology, and I will let him explain that term to you if you're wondering what phenology is all about. He's the guy to tell us, and I like to use the plan words. Phenology is all about fun. Slightly different spelling, but it is very fun. So thank you, Mr. Rossi, all for right. being here. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the Wakuda Nature Notes, uh, our daughter puts this together. I take photographs and uh, then I send her an email of, of my photos along with scripts. And then once a year for Christmas she puts it together in hard copy. But if you're interested in the website for the Nature Blog, I have some cards I can pass out afterwards. So, uh, maybe we need to have some definitions before I get started. And the first one is phenology. Uh, the last few letters of phenology is, is O-L-O-G-Y, ology. So if you're studying biology, you're studying life. If you're studying geology, you're studying earth or rocks. Uh, if you're studying zoology, you're studying animals. Well, phenology is the study of the relationship between certain events in nature and how they occur with the seasons. So what I've done basically is I have uh, a couple photos from each month of the year to kind of give you uh, a feel for the various seasons. And uh, at the same time that we're doing this, I'd like to talk a little bit about climate change. This is a topic that's in the news. And uh, <clears throat> before we get too far in that, we need to have a couple definitions. And maybe I can ask you for, for help. What does the word uh, weather mean compared to climate? Anyone want to take a stab at that? If we're talking about weather or we're talking about climate? Anyone? I would guess that weather is our events and the climate is weather or events over time. Anyone want to add to that? It's very good. Uh, an analogy is this. If you're um, a fan of Minnesota Twins baseball and you watch uh, Joe Maurer, and one particular day he goes four for five or five for five with a two or three doubles, uh, that's an example of weather. And uh, if the next day he goes 0 for 5, that's an example of weather. <coughs> However, if you look at his batting average over the course of the year, that would be climate. And that's about as simple as we can make it. So <clears throat> when people 
uh, think about climate change and, and they say, well, man, we've had a pretty good winter here. It's been a typical Minnesota or Wisconsin winter. Uh, they question maybe that there is some climate change. Well, you have to look at the long picture. Now, one of the things about nature is that it has a tendency to reflect some changes over time. And some plants and some animals are pretty good at adapting to these changes, whereas there's other plants and animals that are not able to adapt. And as a result, some of these plants and animals are probably facing some dire consequences. Well, anyway, we will start with January. <clears throat> and uh, uh, when I was growing up in southern Minnesota, it was a big deal to see a cardinal. I can still remember uh, my parents had a bird feeder outside the kitchen window, and we'd get house sparrows and chickadees and occasional nuthatches, but every once in a while we'd get a cardinal. And that was a big deal, and they'd holler at us to come on down and take a look. Anybody here have a similar experience? Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> recently there have been reports of pe people seeing cardinals up on the North Shore. Uh, just an example of how they have migrated, probably for a couple reasons. One is that our winters aren't as severe anymore, and also people are feeding birds more. Uh, <clears throat> now, robins are another uh, another bird species, and uh, Kathy and I just saw uh, our first robins. We're assuming our first migratory robins uh, middle of this past week, Wednesday and Thursday. How many here have seen robins yet? I just heard one outside when I came. There you are. Good. Anybody else? Okay. Well, believe it or not, if you have the right situation with a little open water and maybe some berries, maybe some high bush cranberries left over, or some buckthorn and, and a few berries like this, it's becoming more and more common now to see robins in the wintertime. So they are around 12 months of the year. Now these birds had a bad hair day. <laughs> these are female common mergansers. And they also have a more common name called sawbills. How many here have been up on the North Shore and have traveled up the sawbill trail? You have? Anybody else? Okay. There's a lake up in the Boundary Waters called Sawbill Lake. That particular trail and that lake and that area got the name sawbill be from these birds. These are birds that nest in trees, like a wood duck, and uh, uh, the thing that's interesting, oh, another thing, the reason that they have the, the name sawbill is that they have a serrated bill for catching fish. That makes it much easier for them to catch their fish. Uh, one of the more interesting things, whether you're living in Prescott or Red Wing or Diamond Bluff or whatever, is that in the fall of the year, late fall, November, December, we have the largest migration of this bird anywhere in the world. And they congregate on the river. And as Lake Pepin starts to freeze up, they'll, these concentrations will become much greater uh, sometimes as many as 80,000 of them uh, in the area, up, upper part of Lake Pepin near Red Wing, you know, all the way up to Diamond Bluff and down around Reeves Landing where there's open water. Uh, quite a spectacle, to say the least. And sometimes, which was the case this winter, some of these birds will even stay here all winter. They. Uh, <clears throat> They nest in trees, like I mentioned, like wood ducks. And it's not uncommon to see them, if you're paddling around up in the boundary waters, you'll see them with a brood of maybe anywhere from 10 to 12 uh, little ducklings going along with them. 
also February is a time uh, because they are attracted to suet of seeing woodpeckers, pileated woodpeckers. And David and Anne Marie over here called me up a couple years ago and said uh, they had something that uh, you very seldom see. I believe you said you had a nesting pair of pileated woodpeckers and they actually were able to watch the young, young ones. Now, uh, if you look closely, can you determine which one's the male and which one's the female? From, what? Here, from here, it looks like they're both female. Female? Well, if you got a little closer, you'd find out one of them was. Do, <clears throat> can you tell on the crown of the bird, does one of them have more red than the other one? Yeah. Which one? One on the right. One on the right. And if you look even closer, you'll see that the one on the right has a red mustache that goes along the side of its head. So that's the male, the other one's a female. And uh, uh, in the wintertime, we put out a big chunk. That thing is totally full with suet. And uh, in the dead of winter, when it's really cold, uh, they are very punctual. They'll usually show up about the same time we're having breakfast every morning. And then maybe one at a time th throughout the day to come in by themselves. Okay, <clears throat> what's this bird? Snowy owl. Snowy owl. And uh, they will migrate down here, not every year, it's usually about every four years they'll come down. And it was thought for a long time that they came down here because there wasn't enough food up in the Arctic. These are Arctic birds. Well, through some studies with radio telemetry and a few other things, more in-depth research, they've discovered that these birds come down here for a different reason, primarily. And the different reason is that uh, in the summertime, their food source, the lemmings, or the rodents that they, they eat, are so abundant that instead of having two or three young per nest, they'll have 10 and 12. And so these big broods hatch out and they're quite territorial. And with that many, they're forced into moving south uh, in search of food. Now, <clears throat> uh, the owl is our earliest nester. Uh, even earlier than bald eagles. How many, I'm just kind of curious, how many people have been watching the eagle cam that the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources keeps in tabs of? What's happened in the last couple of days with that? It was abandoned, right? Right. We, w we checked it the other day and for some reason it was abandoned. That's kind of an exception with that eagle they very seldom will nest before owls. But one of the thoughts be, that I've heard people talk about that is the reason that this eagle or these pair of eagles nest so early is that th this nest is in the, in the metro where there's a lot of ambient light. And light is one of the things that, you know, changing length of day throughout the seasons is one of the reasons that uh, birds start nesting when they do. But with the owls, this is a barred owl, and its call is, who, who, who cooks for you? Have you ever heard, heard that owl in the evening? One of the things that I used to do when I had uh, my students at the environmental center, we'd go camping uh, on maybe a two-night, three-day trip on the Zumbra River, and I'd bring along an owl call. And then after all the kids had gone to sleep, I'd get on this call, maybe about midnight, and I'd, uh, the next thing you know, I'd have barred owls right up above the tents. And in the morning, you could hear some of the interesting stories. <laughs> that, uh, so that was, that was interesting. All right, what's going on here? Anyone? Maple syrup, and we're right, if we're not in the midst of it, we're awful close to it. And uh, 
for many, many years when I was working at the Environmental Center and we'd run our maple syrup programs, uh, it was, we'd always kind of figured that we'd start on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and that we were pretty consistently hitting it right on the money. And it's going to be pretty close to St. Patrick's Day this year when it starts. However, last year, believe it or not, I started making maple syrup on the 8th of February. And this is one of the activities that has probably been definitely affected by climate change. And one of the problems for, you know, it's no big deal for people like me who just want to make a little bit of syrup for our own use and maybe to give away for gifts. But for commercial operators who have thousands of dollars invested in uh, collection systems and boiling systems and all the new age uh, ways of producing it, it, it gets to be a big, big deal because the season is shortened. And the, the reason for that is that lately we've tended to have uh, falls, particularly November, December, with not much snow. And at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean we don't have some cold weather, which was definitely the case this year. We had some very cold weather. And what that does is it sends a frost very deep into the ground. And this, this sap, most of it is in the root systems. And if you have three, four feet of frost, and then you get some snow and so on, it takes so much time for that ground to thaw out before that sap can move that eventually you get so far into the season, the next thing you know you have 60, 70 degrees. What happens to the buds of the tree? They bud out and you're done. The sap turns bitter, and so the seasons have shortened. For me, it used to be maybe, I tap primarily soft maple or silver maple. It used to be maybe three weeks, three and a half weeks. Last year I tapped for about a week, and I was done. Uh, and so with the commercial operators who tap with sugar maple, I think it's gone from like six weeks, maybe down to four weeks or whatever. So it has a definite impact. This year they should be okay, providing we don't get the 70 degrees because there still is a fair amount of frost in the ground. Anyone want to take a stab at the very first flowering plant in the woods around Prescott or Red Wing? Cabbage. What? Skunk cabbage. Hey, right on. Skunk cabbage. These are the blossoms of the skunk cabbage. The leaves don't come out until much later on. Uh, and it gets its name from the fact that if you happen to step on this, it emits its smell like a skunk. And there's a natural uh, advantage to this plant of having this smell. And that is that uh, it attracts insects, and the insects help with the pollination of the plant. Another interesting thing about skunk cabbage is that through the normal living process or the metabolism of this plant, it gives off heat. And there have been accounts of this plant actually coming up and blooming right through the snow. It just melts the snow and uh, opens up. Very interesting plant. So now we're into the end of March and uh, early April, and we start hearing the sandhill cranes. Anybody here heard sandhill cranes yet? Oh, not this year. I did a few days ago. You did? Before the storm actually came through. I was okay. hoping they could fly around that big storm. <laughs> okay, good. I haven't heard any cranes yet, but this morning, just as we were coming out to uh, come up here, I did hear the first flock of uh, tundra swans go over. Uh, but uh, the cranes, uh, it's amazing how their numbers have increased around our area. And I'm assuming the same is true up here in the last 10, 15 years. We, we see a lot more sandhill cranes. And kind of as a sidelight, if you ever are looking for an adventure, probably an adventure of a lifetime, 
and you have a few extra days, I would highly recommend that you go out to Kearney or Grand Island, Nebraska. Have any of you ever been there to see the Sandhill Cranes? It's just, you won't forget it. They estimate that in the main part of the migration, there's up to half a million Sandhill Cranes. And they come there and they'll spend two, three weeks, uh, you know, having kind of gleaning the cornfields that were picked last year to get more energy to continue their migration up to up to the Arctic. All right, now probably one of the more noticeable spring wildflowers, and this is the pasque flower. Uh, do, do you have any pasque flowers here on the south side of the bluff? Do you? Well, in our gardens as demonstration plants. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, this is a plant. It, it won't happen this way this year, but usually uh, I'll see this plant blooming uh, towards the end of March, uh, maybe the first part of April, more commonly first part of April, maybe the first week of April. Last year I saw some of these blooming uh, the first part of March. So uh, they definitely react to, to temperature and, and warmth. All right, how many have seen their first wood ducks or heard their worth first? Well, I've been keeping my ears and eyes open. I haven't seen any, so it shouldn't be too much longer. But uh, Kathy and I have a, a pond in our backyard that's close enough to our sunroom that we can kind of watch some activity and uh, <clears throat> we get a, a big thrill out of watching them in the spring uh, and we also have two nesting boxes that they use so it's quite a sight to have uh, a, a pair of wood ducks nesting in one of your wood duck boxes generally speaking uh, the nesting, most of it, will take place during the month of May uh, into June. But uh, she will lay one egg a day until her clutch is full, which is anywhere from maybe 10 to 12 eggs. After the clutch is full, then she starts to incubate. And it's usually anywhere from about 28 to 32 days before they hatch. So in most cases, I have a pretty good idea by watching. Once she's on the nest, she only leaves that nest twice a day. Once right at daybreak and right at sunset. The rest of the time she's in that box. So I watch and whenever she takes off, I'll go down and I'll count the eggs. And then I have a pretty good idea when she started nesting and uh, when they'd be hatching. So uh, I have a, a blind that I set up near there and I go down with my camera and watch them come out. <laughs> and keep in mind that they don't, they don't fly, they jump. And they're all either hollow bones or, or down. And so they just kind of bounce on the ground. But when, she, when the hen, early in the morning, she'll stick her head out, I'll back up. Usually they'll hatch during the day, late afternoon. And she never takes them out the same day they hatch. They always, she keeps them in that box and cleans them up and gets them dried off. And then you could expect the next morning for them to leave. And what she'll do is she'll, the hen will stick her head out maybe two or three times, 15, 20 minutes apart, just make, sure that the coast is clear, there's no dogs or cats or anything. Then she'll jump out and as she's jumping out, she'll start calling them and they come out kind of like popcorn. <laughs> and once, once she has them all gathered up, then she marches them to the river. So it is quite a, quite a spectacle. At about the first part of April, uh, about the time that the, the wood ducks come back, the uh, eagles that are nesting around here, with the exception of the one you've been watching up in, in the cities, 
uh, will start hatching their young. And it's an interesting situation. I mentioned that the wood ducks don't start incubating until all the eggs are laid. These birds can't afford to do that because they start laying their eggs when the snow's on the ground. So they have to start incubating after the first egg is laid. So you have a situation where if, if the female lays an egg and doesn't lay another one for two or three days, there's a, there's a time lag between number one hatching and number three hatching. Sometimes number three uh, eaglet will not survive for a variety of reasons. But usually the first part of April, first week of April is when you can see uh, when most of the eaglets hatch. How about one of the more noticeable spring wildflowers? No, not the trillium. Anyone? All right, the blood root. The blood root. Uh, <clears throat> definitely one of the more common spring wildflowers. This is usually hatching around the first part of May in the hardwood forests. And at about that time, or maybe shortly thereafter, we have the migration of the Baltimore Orioles. And we're lucky enough, we have a couple big trees in our yard. We have a big cottonwood tree and a, a big silver maple. And invariably, we'll have a nest, at least in one of the trees, and for the most part, we'll have maybe two or three, maybe maybe four or five Orioles that stick around throughout the, the summertime. But in the spring when they're migrating, sometimes we'll have, in this case, we had up to 20 of them at our jelly feeders all at once. And what happened was that these birds start to migrate and then you have a big cold front that's coming down from up north and somehow they sense that and they just hang hang where they're at until that bad weather moves through and then they'll continue on. But usually you can expect to see your first Orioles around the first, first week of May. How about those? Morels. How many, let's show of hands, how many people have hunted morels? All right, quite a few. And uh, for years, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I had never hunted morels growing up, and when I was able to be lucky enough to get the job that I ended up with, I had a friend uh, who was retired, and, and he was quite an outdoors person, and, and uh, he said, how would you like to uh, go out hunting morels with me, and then you can show the, the kids how to hunt them, and I said, that'd be great. So. <clears throat> First time I went out with him and we get in the woods and he said, now what you really want to do when you walk through the woods is you want to look up into the air. And I said, I thought mushrooms grew on the ground. <laughs> he says, well, you want to walk along until you see a dead elm tree. And when you see that dead elm tree, you walk over and look at the base of that elm tree and that's where you're going to find the morels. So uh, that's not always true, but I'd say in the vast majority of the mushrooms I've found over the years have been under a dead elm tree. But here's another interesting thing. For many years, he and I and others would always start looking for morels about the time the lilacs started blooming, which was usually on Memorial weekend. In the last few years, I found morels even the end of April, much, much earlier than uh, in the past. So, now we're getting into June. What's kind of odd and strange about this photograph? How many of you have seen a Canada goose up in a tree? Doesn't happen very often. Well, if you go back in history in the Lewis and Clark expeditions that they uh, recalled in their writings, it was quite common to see geese in trees and also geese nesting in trees because uh, they were safe. They were safe from the wolves and the coyotes if they would nest in a busted off cottonwood tree. Uh, so it was fairly common, but not so much anymore. Uh, that's one of the reasons I took this photograph. 
<clears throat> well, shortly after I took this photograph, one afternoon I got a call from a, a father of one of my students. And he said, the first thing you need to know is I haven't been drinking. <laughs> but he said, I have been making a trip from Red Wing to Lake City, and there was an eagle nest in Frontenac State Park. There's a pond along Highway 61 called Frontenac Pond. I don't know if you're familiar with it. But on the east end of that pond, there's been an eagle nest there for quite a few years. And he said, I always stop, pull off the side of the road, and with a pair of binoculars, I'd just look and see if there's been any activity. And well, he said, today when I looked up there, he said, you wouldn't believe it. There's a Canada goose on the nest. <laughs> <laughs> so can you imagine those little goslings the first time they decided to leave home. <laughs> and into June, the young male deer are starting to grow their new antlers. And you can see the velvet on the outside of the antlers. And uh, also at about this time, June primarily, is when the snapping turtles start to go up on the sand beaches and, and lay their eggs. Uh, usually, uh, I shouldn't say usually, but a good percentage of the time these nests are found by what kind of predators? Raccoons, possum, skunks. So you, if you know of some areas where these turtles are nesting, invariably you're going to find some eggshells where one of these three, maybe a fox, will dig them up and, and uh, that'll be the end of them. All right, now we're getting into the latter part of June and the bluebirds are starting to nest. And here's a male bluebird bringing in some type of insect for its young. Well, I might back up a little bit uh, before I go on. Uh, with the bluebirds, uh, <clears throat> the, there's another bird that also likes to use these, uh, these boxes, and that would be uh, tree, uh, tree swallows. And, but it's real easy to tell the difference between a bluebird uh, nest and a, a tree swallow nest. The bluebird makes its nest out of grass, finely woven grass, and they have blue eggs. Tree swallow makes its nest out of feathers, uh, and it has a white egg. So that's one difference. And another thing is that when the tree swallow makes these nests uh, out of feathers, usually about the last one that goes in the nest is a white feather. Uh, just like you put up a number on your house, that's what they do. They put up a white, a white feather. Now, uh, anyone recognize these berries? Black caps. Black caps, commonly called black caps, black raspberries. Uh, I usually start looking for these around the Fourth of July, and as much as the climate has been jumping back and forth, it, I still find my first berries around the Fourth of July. It's just really pretty interesting. How about these guys here? These are people, some people call them mayflies, some people call them scoplatches, and, but they uh, <clears throat> usually start in hatching. I'm sure you get plenty of them here in Prescott. Uh, sometimes there's been stories where they used to have to take the snow plow out to get them off the high bridge in Red Wing. The uh, clouds. Yep, yep. Which is a, really a good sign, because why? Clean environment. All right, the water's much cleaner in a real fil filthy situation when, back in the day when they used to take the honey buckets off the, the bridges in the, and dump the sewage directly into the river in the Twin Cities, the river was devoid of mayflies. So uh, that is a good sign. And then we get into, uh, into the latter part of the summer and we start seeing quite a few monarchs. But the number of monarchs that we've been seeing is greatly diminished for a number of reasons. Probably the biggest one is 
is the uh, herbicides that are being used on a lot of our crops because monarchs are dependent upon uh, milkweed primarily. Uh, they will get their food from other sources but they lay their eggs on milkweeds and, and the young larvae depend exclusively on milkweed so as they have been diminished in the number of monarchs. But I've always thought that this is one of the real miracles of life or miracles of nature when you think about the fact that these insects spend, what, eight months wintering in Mexico and then they start the migration and they get as far as southern Texas or Arizona and they mate and reproduce and the offspring from that mating come up to Wisconsin or Minnesota and spend the summer they reproduce and the offspring head back to a place that they've never been. You think about that, it's pretty incredible. All right, then the colors start uh, showing up. This happens to be um, a restored prairie on the tarp top of Barn Bluff. A uh, lot of different uh, colored prairie plants. And I'm sure the same thing is true here uh, as it is in Red Wing. In recent years, maybe the last 10, 15 years, we've seen an awful lot of, of white pelicans. Do you see them up here quite a bit? Now, one of the things that's interesting about white pelicans, if you've been to Florida or Texas, you no doubt have seen brown pelicans. And these brown pelicans will fly around and then they dive into the water and catch their fish. These birds can't do that. What they do is they will be in a big group and they'll kind of spread out and then they kind of move towards shore to the shallower water. And then when they get near shore, they start thrashing their feet around and that spooks the small fish. And the fish come up and then they scoop them up with a their bill, get a couple gallons of water, and close their mouth, tip their head to the side, let the water run out, and they've got the fish left behind. But one, <clears throat> one of the more uh, unique things about these birds is that when they're flying, they'll fly and they'll turn in unison. They all just kind of turn at the same time. You wonder how they communicate, but again, another marvel of nature. Uh, this is kind of an exception to the rule. Most of the woodland flowers that we're familiar with, like the bloodroot and uh, oh, some of the other ones, the jack in the pulpit and so on, they bloom early before the canopy develops in the, in the woods because they need sunlight. This wildflower doesn't bloom until August. Anyone want to take a stab? Service berry, that's a guess. No, it looks a little bit like that, but it's not. White snake root. White snake root. We've got a pretty sharp gal here running this program. <laughs> All right, white snake root. And there's a real interesting history behind white snake root. When the early pioneers were moving west and they started settling in Illinois and Ohio and Indiana and wherever and maybe taking up a homestead and, and have a small farm or whatever. For a number of years they were noticing that come into August and people were getting sick and they couldn't figure it out. They didn't know what, what was going on and finally they connected the dots and they discovered that they're at this time of the year their cows were eating this plant and it was causing the cows to get sick with a disease called milk sickness and if the cow ate enough of it it would kill the cow if it didn't eat that much and still kept giving milk and you drank the milk you could become very sick and in many cases people died from it and Abraham Lincoln's mother died when he was 11 years old because she drank milk that was contaminated from cows that had <coughs> consumed this plant. It's, it's a very colorful flower, 
Kathy always has me go out and gather it up and bring it, put on the table in the house, but she never asks me to eat it. <laughs> so uh, we don't have any problems there, but it makes a very, very nice floral arrangement. And I've seen that done in a lot of different places. So it's very abundant. You see a lot of it. It's not toxic if you touch it. It's only if you uh, ingest it. All right, and what do we have here? Some, some kind of what? Hawk. Hawk. All right. <clears throat> now <clears throat> look real closely off to the right side on the ground. What do you see? A tail. Right. This is the tail of a <clears throat> gray squirrel. And a few years ago, I <clears throat> had a call, <clears throat> excuse me, from a, a neighbor, and she knew I liked to take photographs. She said, you gotta bring your camera down because I've got something in the yard I can't hardly believe. She said, half an hour ago, this red-tailed hawk came in and caught this squirrel. It's on the ground, and it's just there, it just stays there. This was like nine o'clock in the morning. And so, um, I grabbed my camera, went down, and. I got down there and I said, is it still here? And she says, yeah, it's right over there. So I got this closest from here to the door and got this photograph and it just acted as if I wasn't even there. So I went home and about noon, just for the nuts of it, I called her back and I said, is that thing still there? And she says, yeah, it is. Um, so late in the day, about five o'clock, I called back for the second time I says is that bird still there she said would you believe it just left a few minutes ago so I couldn't understand that strange behavior so I called the National Eagle Center in Wabasha and there's a fellow down there <clears throat> his name is Scott Mayhus who's the director of education and I said I told him what had happened I said what in the world is with this hawk he says well it's like this he said the eagles are the same way these young birds know how to hunt, but they don't know what to do when they catch it. <laughs> and you know, <clears throat> they have spent so much of their life having the parent rip the food apart and everything, give it to them, uh, that when it comes time for them to uh, kind of get involved in the process. They don't know exactly how to go about it. Turkey vultures. And you see those all summer. In fact, we're looking for our first turkey vultures. I've kind of kept track the last few years and it's really, it's almost uncanny. But about the first day of spring, March 20th, is when we see our first turkey vultures. It's really quite, quite interesting. And then after they're done nesting and they start gathering late in the summer into the fall, uh, you can see 40, 50 of them in a, in a group circling overhead. But uh, any idea why, they, uh, why they're doing this? Cool. Pardon? To cool off. Cool off? Dry, I've seen them warm themselves, dry themselves off in the morning sunlight. Okay, I should have given you a, a clue as to what time, this was early in the morning. So your answer is, is the fact that they were trying to warm up. But <clears throat> the other reason they do this is that their main food is carrion, dead stinky stuff that is harboring a lot of bacteria and viruses. They're using the ultraviolet light of the sun to help disinfect their, their feathers and so on. That's another reason they don't have feathers on their head. Uh, getting back to uh, a little bit more about the turkey vulture, they have a bad habit of <clears throat> uh, consuming more than what they should. And when they do that, they are not very good at getting off the ground. So occasionally they'll be hit by cars. And another thing that <clears throat> you should know about them, if you see one along the side of the road, is that they are very instinctive. If they see imminent danger, 
approaching, they vomit. Oh. And I've heard of people having to take their car into the car wash <laughs> after getting too close to one of them. All right, then you have the, uh, <clears throat> the fall colors, some of the early. You have the sumac turning color, the leaves particularly, and then the, the goldenrod. Uh, and then after that, the oaks and the maples start turning. And then the cedar wax wings are eating some of the products of, of the summer. These happen to be high bush cranberries, but they'll eat just about any berries that they can, <clears throat> that they can get. And then we're getting into November, the mating season or the rutting season of the deer. And <clears throat> one of the things, again, that's quite interesting is that um, the changing seasons or the changing weather or climate that we've been experiencing doesn't really affect this particular event because this event is triggered again by the change of daylight. It's called photoperiodism. And I can remember not that many years ago going out deer hunting and I had on every bit of clothing that I owned to stay warm. In recent time, you could practically go out in a pair of shorts. Uh, it's been quite interesting. And then, at about that same time, the deer hunting's going on, you hear the swans going over, the tundra swans that I mentioned a minute ago that are on their way north. Uh, now, they're heading south uh, in November. Um, still in November, and if you think you've had a tough day, and they work and work and work for how long and that tree doesn't go over, uh, but this always takes place late fall, early winter, when they're trying to put forth a supply of, of food for the winter. And that supply of food is in the way of a feed pile which you can see on the right hand side of this beaver lodge. Uh, that's there, as this pond freezes over, they can sw still swim down under the ice, get at their food. And, well, we've had an interesting situation <clears throat> where we live. We live in Wakuda, which is just upstream from the lake. And there's been a beaver lodge there I've been watching for the last couple of years. And uh, as you know, the water level this year has been, in this winter has been quite low. And so <clears throat> late in the fall, they had to move from their existing lodge and they built another lodge just because the water was too low. They had to create a new feed pile. And now just within the last couple of weeks, because of the cold weather this winter, that pond is frozen all the way to the bottom. So they couldn't get at that feed pile even though it was still there. So what they've had to do there's a huge big hole in the ice. They literally chewed their way right up and now they're going throughout the woods trying to find any kind of food that they can. And given the fact they have very poor eyesight and they're pretty clumsy on land, this puts them in a very vulnerable situation. You know, coyotes or whatever can get at them. And then we're into December, things start cooling down and the eagles are starting their southward migration. And this year was incredible at Colville. We many days would have over 100 eagles at the park. So uh, it's quite, quite a spectacle. And now I think this is my last slide here in the fact that in recent times, maybe the last 10, 15 years, there have been more and more uh, sightings of trumpeter swans. These are the big swans that are native to Minnesota and Wisconsin. And um, for, for years they were overhunted uh, and basically were gone from both of the states and there's been quite an quite a effort to reintroduce them. And um, right up river here from you, up at Hudson, 
There's quite a number. How many have been up to see those trumpeters? Anybody? Okay. Another place, if you want to go and really see something pretty amazing, and that's right below the, uh, the nuclear plant in Monticello. There are probably a, oh, close to a thousand that spend the winter there. Uh, but they are native. As long as they can find open water, they will, uh, they will stick around. And uh, uh, they're just so, so much bigger than the other swans, and their calls are very distinctive. If you hear one go over, you won't, you know, you won't mistake it. Yeah. During the uh, <coughs> Christmas bird count this year, we come with 88 swans along the river. Oh, you did? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's interesting. That's, do you think some of those might have been from Hudson? I think they're all from Hudson. Oh, they all were. Okay. Okay. Now, I do know that they have, I didn't go out there this year, but I do know that uh, just near the nuclear plant there, just downstream, uh, right by Lock and Dam number three, there are quite a few that um, will spend the winter in there. But, okay, I don't know if anybody has any, oh yes. How far south would they go if they didn't have the environment here along the river? Oh, they'd probably go far enough to just find open just water kind of like the eagles do. But <clears throat> there's enough open water now that they, they stay here. I've yet to find a, a, an active nest. I'd love to find a nest. And any of you have ever seen a nest? I was gonna ask that. What about, and where do they nest? They, where they like they'll nest in, like in the backwaters, I suspect more like in, in an area with cattails, and so they've got that for protection. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you record your, your notes of the things that happen every year? And then are there any computer programs or online things that you submit information to? Only on my nature blog. Yeah. That would be just it. Okay. Yeah. We, we haven't been very good here at the park of collecting information, but moving forward, it would be nice to, to submit it and collect it in a way that we could have that information. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have any specifics on this, but I do know that there's an organization in Minnesota that's, that's their focus. It's just uh, phenology. They have an annual convention every year of, of phenologists. And, and if you get it, the Minneapolis Star and Tribune, uh, I think it's on Friday or Sunday, I can't remember, but the uh, Jim Gilbert, who's also on WCCO radio, he has a column in there every week on, as it relates to different uh, phenology, so. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.